بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم به نستعين وهو نعم المولى ونعم النصير ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا أفرغ علينا صبرا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين وأفضل الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين اللهم نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله Respected elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون As we gather during these sacred nights of Muharram and spend time in reflection and contemplation and spend efforts and exertion on the path of realization, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to count us amongst the dhakirin and the shakirin and the hamidin. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in particular to unveil the mysteries of the inner and outer realities of the sacred months and the qiyam of our Imam, Sayyid al Shahada, Imam Hussein, Salamullah Alayh, and his companions and the family of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The topic at hand is the ethics of resistance. And I briefly mentioned last night that the human being is in constant resistance. This resistance has various areas of manifestation and practice, whether it is in the realm of the spirit and spiritual resistance, which within the contours and within the parameters of Islamic spirituality is considered the purification of the soul. The purification of the soul centers itself on two things. The first one is that the individual must have ma'rifah and understanding and awakening to those things that reside within him or her that are veils of separation and darkness and prevention of seeing the reality as such. Generally, there are particular things that reside within us and are not placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there, but reside within us as a result of forgetfulness and sin and ignorance. He, amongst these diseases of the heart or these diseases of the soul, is arrogance, is selfishness, is lust, is jealousy, is anger, and other things which cast the dark shadows of temptation upon the existence and the psychology of the person. However, there are remedies and there are ways to combat and to defeat and to become ghalib and successful and victorious over these energies that reside within you and I. Islam as a religion that is complete and is considerate of both the inner and outer needs and realities of the human being and of this world presents to us a set number of spiritual practices and contemplative patterns that allow you and I to become not only aware of the presence and the danger of these things, but to be able to decrease and eventually, insha'Allah ta'ala, overcome and defeat these evils. 
within this category of remedies is the presence of dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe one way for us to understand the meaning of dhikr is to understand it in the terms that dhikr is a realization and a sensitization. The realization is that there is no reality or truth except that of God. La ilaha illallah. And the sensitization is that with each breath and with each word that you utter in a state of dhikr, you are lovingly recalling and returning to that primordial state of purity and awareness, wherein the remembrance of your Lord inspires and illuminates and informs your very existence. This is identified by love. Sultana Kainat ki in kar khana sakht, maqsood ashesh ku jahanra bahana sakht. The purpose and the reason for existence and creation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extending this love to you and I. Now, in order for resistance to really make sense, because there are all types of resistance that takes place, some forms of resistance are actually rooted in evil. They are attempting to defeat particular things that are good and beneficial. Recently, at a discussion and an invitation, uh, the topic at hand was, how do laws come into effect in the United States? How is it decided that particular bills should pass and others should not? And for anyone who's had a rudimentary and elementary exposure and education in political science, you realize that it's not the will of the people. It's actually the power of lobbyists and special interest groups. So when there are particular needs in a society, such as healthcare, that is sorely needed in this country, that is the only industrialized nation in this planet that lacks universal health care, or if it is a bill that deals with the climate catastrophe that human beings have created and generated, when Islam says that, that the servants of the most merciful are those who when they walk upon this earth, or in other words, the way that they live and the way that they pursue their lives and their livelihoods is with humbleness and concern and sensitivity to this earth. Now, when you see the realities of this climate catastrophe that is destroying our environment, that is destroying entire ecosystems, that is destroying entire places of life and livelihood, that is going to lead to millions of individuals who will become refugees, not because of war, but because of the climate. They are referred to as climate refugees. And this is going to happen. And that is why the great so-called worldly powers are after the very limited amount of resources, in particular water that is left upon this earth. And they are resisting the calls and the needs of the population to actually enact that which is to their benefit. So it's not that every resistance and every effort to change things is good and praiseworthy. But the difference and the distinction between what makes a resistance valid and a resistance invalid can possibly be summarized into what their aims are for. Is it selfish? Is it nafsani? Is it so that you and your particular group can benefit at the expense of everyone else? Well, that's not resistance. That's facade. That's corruption. And facade has many different meanings, including excess, including harmful behavior, anything that skews and uh, changes the equilibrium and harmony and balance is facade. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in beautiful harmony. And this religion has come with a system and with a call that asks you and I to maintain this beautiful harmony and to understand it and to resist attempts to allow this to deviate and shift. But this resistance that you and I are called upon and this resistance that Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi embodies and is the paragon of has its own ethics. Not everything is allowed in this resistance. Not everything can be done, right? The ends don't justify the means, in other words. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Shu'ara, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wala tabkhasu nasa ashya'ahum, Wala yabathu fil ardi mufsidin. Do not deprive, do not limit, do not decrease, do not deny people that which is their rights. Ashia'ahum would literally translate as their things, but it must be understood as their rights. That which they are allowed, that which is theirs. And one of the rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala centers in the Quran for all of humanity and for, for all of us is وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has insisted and implies in very clear terms that we have granted and bestowed and endowed the children of Adam, meaning mankind, humanity, not just the Arab, not just the non-Arab, not just the white, not just the black, not just the rich nor poor, but everyone who is granted the magic of life, you understand how difficult it is to be born. How easily do we take for granted this few moments of life that we have? Do you ever think about this? You know, people who come and they complain about life over and over and over again. They're hopeless about life. Like, hopelessness is considered one of the greatest sins in Islam. And when you look at Karbala, and when you look at the Imam, Salamullah alayhi, and when you look at his companions, you see, do not imagine them to be fearful because they weren't. Do not imagine them to be hopeless because they weren't. They were filled with hope. They were filled with confidence. They were filled with trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, the narrations are very clear in this. The human being must have hope. Life is a beautiful gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has extended to you and I. But with every gift and with every blessing, there is a responsibility and there is a sacred trust of care and concern and protection and safeguarding. And we must resist all attempts, inner and outer, for this sacredness to be trampled upon. Now, the call of Imam Hussein, salamullah alayhi, is very clear. I mentioned last night that Karbala can be summarized in these very brief words. Do not allow anyone to deny you your honor. When God has granted you and I honor, this honor is a tremendous thing. This honor means that we have a right to exist and be. We have a right to be respected. We have a right to think. We have a right to speak. We have a right to freely move. We have a right to our opinions. We have a right to the safety of our beliefs, right? But also not to dishonor anyone else. Most resistance movements, most revolutionary movements throughout human history have always raised the standard of the call for justice, the defeat of the forces of oppression and injustice until they themselves become the holders of power. Is that not the case? 
when they become the holders of power, they completely turn against those principles that they rose up for. There's no ethics there in that resistance. But true resistance means that every aspect and every step of our lives must have a moral system. It must have a right and wrong. Particularly when it comes not only to our own rights and our own needs, but Karbala and the Sunan of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam and the seerah and the way of Imam Ali Sallallahu Alaihi and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, the message of the Quran insists that you must be extremely cautious about the rights of others. Other tremendous examples of this. In the book of Bukhari, the narrations of Bukhari, there's a very interesting narration. It is noted that the Prophet وسلم, borrowed a particular amount of money from a Jewish person. And they had agreed that the Prophet would pay back this amount at a particular time. It is narrated that this individual comes to the mosque of the Prophet and confronts the Prophet and uses very demeaning and unbecoming words towards the Prophet of God. Now, in Bukhari, it mentions that the second Khalif, Umar, takes out his sword and says that I will strike your head because of the way that you have spoken against the Prophet. Right? He loves the Prophet. Someone is disrespecting the Prophet in his mosque. He should speak out against it. This is what we can infer and, and, and read from this metan, from this text. But something very interesting happens, Azizan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam turns to the second Khalifa Umar and says, go bring him what is owed. Listen to this. Go bring him what is owed and give him more because of the way that you spoke to him. You see? This person, as much as he's in the wrong Speaking to the Prophet of God in this manner, the Prophet tells his companion that you should give him something in exchange for how you spoke to him. Even if he did something wrong, you should not have said something that is unbecoming or threatening to the individual. This is the seerah of the Prophet. Our dear brother and esteemed scholar, Ahoy Donishkar, made a very beautiful and interesting point last night, referring to the importance of understanding the activities of Imam Hussein Salamullah Alayhi in different realms, with different people, different levels and different spheres of influence in a society. It is unmatched. There are many things in Karbala that are unmatched. The tragedy of Karbala the disloyalty that occurs in Karbala is unmatched. Not because it's just any individual, but because it's the grandson of the Prophet, the leader of the Ummah, the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's done by others who say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. You see? But the Imam, salamullah alayhi, does something that is very unique and interesting. He tells his companions and those that are gathered that he, can, he is removing their bay'ah and anyone who wants to leave can leave. The imam has such trust and such loyalty and such ethics and such beauty that he knows that these people are after his blood. If he can save the life of someone else, he will. I mentioned that there can be no possibility of a ethics of resistance when we are disloyal and break our promises. You and I make promises every day to God. When we sit in prayer and when we recite the Shahada, we say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. 
It's mudara, it's present. I am testifying, I am witnessing, I am committing to this testimony of faith. And then we turn around and we hurt one another, we sin. We completely trample upon the requirements of right and wrong. We turn a blind eye to the injustices in this world. Yesterday, I briefly mentioned some of the injustices that refugees face in Iran. But look at the way that, for example, workers are treated in the Arab world. A lot of people have nannies and caregivers who come from Bangladesh, who come from the Philippines, who come from other places to care for the children of these so-called shuyukh. They are abused. Many times they are sexually assaulted. They are beaten. They are denied food. And there are even instances actually prevalent that they cannot sit at the same table as the family when they are out. They have to go sit somewhere else. These people say that we are followers of the prophet. How can this happen? How can this happen? There can be no resistance. There can be no revolution. There can be no change without that purification that you and I are in need of. It is that purification that allows you to see wrong for wrong. Allahumma arina al-haqqa. Haqqa. Allow us to see the beauty of truth as truth. And allow us to see the ugliness and the vileness of evil as evil. So how can someone commit such acts and think that their prayer is accepted? Now when the, the army makes the call that they're going to attack the imam the night before and battle is going to happen the next day, the imam, salam Allah alayhi, turns to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salatu was salam and says, oh Abbas, go and see what is their decision and ask them because now we're in the time of Maghrib. And when we remember Imam Hussein, salam Allah alayhi, and when we remember Karbala, but we don't remember prayer, we haven't remembered Karbala. When we remember Imam Hussein, salam Allah alayhi, and we shed tears and we grieve and we cry, but we hurt others, and we haven't shed tears for Imam Hussein. When we lack honesty, we haven't commemorated Karbala. When we are arrogant, we are not with the army of Imam Hussein. When we are ignorant, we are not with the companions of Imam Hussein. He says, go and see and request from them some time so that I can spend it in prayer. He says, I love prayer. I want to have this wida and this najwa with my Lord. I want to spend this last night in prayer, in reflection, in devotion, in submission of God, my beloved. That's my only concern. I do not fear death. I do not fear death. I do not fear loss. There is nothing in this world that is sweeter to me, that is more important to me than truth. And what is there besides the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allahu nuru samawati wa la. The Imam, these are my last words for tonight. Again, insisting on the importance of prayer. When this army of evil butchers and attacks the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen, al-Murtaba, and that of Fatima, Zahra, Salamullah alayha, al-Kawthar, 
it is noted that his blessed body had over 100 tears and piercings. That blood had spilled everywhere and his blessed body, the same body that had the honor not only of being held by the prophet, but as a child climbing upon the noble back of the prophet وسلم, and the prophet out of love and care and concern for him would prolong his sajda. Look at the beautiful relationship between Imam Hussein and sajda in prayer. But they said that the body of Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi after it had been cut and after it had been viciously attacked after days of thirst, everyone began to steal items from the body of the Imam. Someone grabbed one thing, another person came and grabbed something else. They say there's an individual, Mal'oon, by the name of Abu Junoob al Ja'afi, or Ja'afi, depending on the pronunciation. And he stole a camel from Karbala. And he used to use this camel to draw water and to mock the family of the Prophet and the martyrs of Karbala. And Imam Hussein, sallallahu alayhi, you know what he named this camel? He named the camel Hussein. وَلَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ 